All right, everyone, Eric Hayden here with the Weather Service in Moorhead City. We have just about 7.01, so we're going to get started. I know we have a few folks that are logging in as we speak, so we'll kind of go over these things slowly because I know we have more people joining us this evening. Really appreciate you joining us this evening. A couple things to note. Um, this is uh, our Skywarn first presentation for the year, so really uh, appreciate you taking the time this evening. There are a few things in the handout section. So on the control panel, you'll see that there's a handout section, a copy of this presentation in a course certificate. So be sure to check that out. If you do have any um, internet issues or you just want to review the presentation, perhaps you have to take a step away, definitely download that handout. Um, it's a copy of our PDF presentation that we're about to present. Just some technical information. Your microphones have been muted at the moment, so don't worry about any background noise. We will open up the microphones at the end, so if you have a verbal question, you can ask that. At any point, you can raise your hand or send me something through the chat if you would like to speak up about something. Otherwise, again, don't forget about your certificate and your copy of the presentation. If you miss any of it, if you want to review it, if you want to share it with friends, um, you think of somebody that might be interested in this, we will post this, um, the recording itself, to YouTube here at the end. If you're not seeing that panel I'm talking about, where you can ask questions. It may not look like this. You just have to hit the orange arrow to expand it out. And here's where you can unmute your mic when you're able to at the end. I'll um, allow that as we get toward the end of the presentation itself. So welcome to our fifth year of classes. We have done this pre-pandemic. We've been doing this for a long, long time. We really like the online classes because I saw we had folks from Atlantic Beach and Greenville and Kinston up across the Outer Banks and also some folks from outside the area. That's one benefit of the online class. You don't have to drive anywhere. You can certainly attend it from home. Our hope is that you learn a little bit more about the weather service, who we are. We're gonna talk about severe weather. You'll also be in our spotter database after tonight. You filled out your name and email and contact information when you signed up. Do wanna point out one thing. We have a few folks from as far away as Illinois and Maryland and Virginia. You uh, will want to contact your local office to become an official spotter with them. The procedures are the same, reporting hail and high winds and things like that. But when we give out an 800 number later in the class, it won't be applicable to you. Same procedure, but you're going to want to uh, call that different number. Class itself is about 50 minutes and we'll have time for questions. So we still have some people logging on. So I want to ask our first poll question to make this as interactive as possible. Um, just kind of want to put this out there. Who has been with a class with us before? Kind of curious, we always like to um, see how many people have taken these classes before. So I'll give you about another 10 seconds to vote. So have you taken a spotter class with us before? Yes or no? And if you have a chance just to test out all the features in the chat, send me a message. If you said yes, what classes have you been to? Have they all been online? Have, have you done a winter one? Uh, maybe an advanced one kind of let me know in the chat i'm kind of curious to see how our audience is tonight all right looks like most folks are in so we have a nice mix i'll show the results there so almost 50 50 split uh some more folks uh have not been to the class than have so that's a good mix but we still have quite a few people returning so that's that's good to see we always like to see no, new folks taking the uh, class, but also people returning uh, as a refresher, or perhaps it's a new one. And I know some folks are sending me some of those answers in the um, chat. So we see Keith said, uh, has taken the basic out in Kansas City. Jessica mentioned took another Sky One class last year for winter. So welcome Keith uh, to Eastern North Carolina. And Jessica, um, thank you for joining us as a follow-up to our winter class, the spring one. Uh, we'll focus on tornadoes and all the things you see on your screen, things like squall lines um, and also supercells and bow echoes. We see Chuck, I mentioned, had been in, um, at a class up in uh, the Ohio area, Wilmington. Um, so yeah, appreciate those answers. It's good to see a good mix of folks uh, that have joined us for the classes um, this evening. So we mentioned a couple of topics that we're going to cover. Some things to keep in mind if you haven't been to a class with us before, but even if you have, we're going to throw a lot of information at you. Don't be expect, you know, don't expect to know everything about the class itself. We do want to give you some science so that you understand why storms happen. Uh, but our main goal is to report when severe weather happens. That's the whole point of this class. 
I know a lot of you are interested in the weather, which is great. And if you understand that, that's even better. But we want you to focus on what to report to us, when and how. Uh, those will be the main topics that we highlight as we head through the course. We are the National Weather Service. Our main mission is to protect life and property. So we issue things like watches, warnings, and advisories for big things like you see on the screen, like tornadoes and hurricanes, but also things like winter weather, ice storms, and things of that nature. If you're not from Eastern North Carolina, you're somewhere here on this puzzle board of a map. This, this represents all the local National Weather Service offices. We are across far Eastern North Carolina. We cover the uh, Eastern quarter of North Carolina. If you're not in that area, again, uh, follow all the procedures. You're welcome to take this class, but um, hook up with your local office. Mention that you've you know, done the training with the Newport office in, in Eastern North Carolina. And what you'll need from them is more information. They'll give you a local number. Uh, some offices do a spotter ID. They may do some procedures slightly different. So definitely want to hook up with your local office if you're not from the area itself. And what do I mean by the area itself? Eastern North Carolina, so Jacksonville, Greenville, the Outer Banks. Um, Raleigh covers the central part of the state, Wilmington Southeast, and the Richmond or Wakefield office covers across the northeast part of North Carolina. We are unique. Um, the offices along the East Coast, Gulf Coast and West Coast also cover the water, uh, much like the Great Lakes. So we go out to 20 nautical miles. So this yellow shading um, represents the forecasts and warnings we do, not just for the land, uh, but the local rivers, the sounds, and out to 20 nautical miles. So if you've been fishing, been on a boat, been to the beach, we're responsible for those areas as well. Makes it a little unique versus an office a little bit farther inland. All those offices I showed you on the first image, um, that puzzle board uh, picture, they are open 24 seven. Weather never stops, so we always have staff here. Uh, this is what it looked like during Florence where we had everybody here. We are um, a building that is safe, we're up higher. We're one of the higher portions in Carter County, brick building with hurricane shutters that come down. So we're designed to stay here when the weather gets bad. We have multiple backups, including a generator, and then our offices to the north and south can take over for us as well. So that helps us fulfill that mission of protection of life and property. We stay here when the weather gets bad and we alert you to what is upcoming. Where Skywarn ties in is it's a national volunteer program. It's run by the Weather Service and it provides us ground truth of what is happening. What we mean by that is with radar and satellite, with the advances in technology, I have a pretty good idea of what's happening. We can have uh, satellite images that are only minutes old. Now with the new GO-16, with dual pole radar, I can have a pretty good estimate for hail size. But a lot of that is remote sensing. It's looking up higher into the atmosphere, not necessarily at the ground. So that's where a spotter will confirm, is it actually making it to the ground? Are the winds as strong as we think? Uh, do you see a tornado or is it right, right now just a funnel cloud? So your reports really help assist us in the warning decision process. You help us gauge how strong the storm is. So for example, let's say a storm moves over Greenville. We're just about to issue a warning, but we get multiple reports of nickel size hail. In that case, we may hold off on the warning, especially if it looks like it's weakening on radar. Another example is uh, perhaps you're confirming, we've got the warning out and you confirm that the hail is as large as the size of golf balls. We can add that to the, the warning update and say a train spotter has confirmed that we are uh, seeing large hail. So you really add credibility to the warning itself. And we always say this, the trained eye of our storm spotters, still our greatest asset. You confirm what's happening on the ground and we put that information in warnings and it really enhances that whole warning process. Anytime we talk about spotter classes, we like to talk about definitions. Since this one is focused on tornadoes and severe weather and hail, we wanna talk about a couple things. Watches and warnings are pretty similar throughout the year. Hurricane watch, winter storm watch, thunderstorm watch. A watch means conditions are favorable. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna happen, just means all the ingredients are there for it to happen. Um, if they do come together, it's imminent or already occurring, that's where we issue a warning. Uh, so in this case, severe thunderstorm warning, tornado warning, we expect it or we expect it very, very soon. And the analogy, you've probably seen this on social media before, I love baking and cooking and, and eating. So the analogy would be if you're, you know, making something in the kitchen, 
Um, let's say you're making brownies. You've got the box out. Uh, maybe you have the eggs on the counter, the oven's preheating, and your oil has already been measured out. Brownie watch, you know, you know what's probably going to happen, um, but the ingredients haven't necessarily come together just yet. And then if we upgrade it to a warning for the brownies, uh, that would be the timers beeping. You can smell them. Um, it's a minute left on the timer, and it's already pretty much been cooked, and all you need to do is pull it out of the oven. Since we're talking severe uh, thunderstorms, it's a good idea to point out what a severe thunderstorm is. It's not just something with some wind and a lot of lightning and heavy rain. Specifically, it has to have large hail or strong winds. And our definition is one inch or larger for the hail and 58 mile per hour winds. That's roughly the threshold of damage. That size hail, some dings maybe on your aluminum siding or your car, certainly larger, maybe some crop damage more likely. And then when you get winds like that, that's when you start to get some larger branches down. And that is our definition for severe thunderstorms. So we could have one that produces a lot of lightning and it is a danger, especially since lightning is a killer, uh, but it's not considered to be severe unless it meets the criteria of either that large hail and or winds 58 or stronger. A couple other important definitions, that will be um, rotation and in contact with the ground. So funnel clouds and tornadoes, it's good to notice the difference between these. I'm going to leave, leave this definition up here for a second. Notice what's highlighted. It is the words in yellow that are highlighted are most important because they fundamentally are a difference between the two. So what I mean by that is tornadoes, it's rotating, but it's in contact with the ground. A funnel cloud is also rotating, but it is not in contact with the ground. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to highlight some of these things. Um, whether or not you know how a tornado forms or not, not really important. But this is very important when you're reporting to us. If it's a tornado, it's got to be in contact with the ground and it has got to be rotating. And we're going to show you some examples here coming up um, just to reinforce that, that some things can certainly look like they are tornadoes when they are indeed not. Our website is a good thing to bookmark. If you're outside of the area, just remember weather.gov. If you're in Eastern North Carolina, if you add the slash and Newport, you will get to the, um, our specific page, or you can also click on the Eastern part of North Carolina. Really good for past, um, you know, significant information on past storms that we've had in our area. The current forecast, you can click anywhere on the map itself. You can enter your city or zip code in the upper left. And it's nice to bookmark and go as in depth as you want. So zoom into where you live, bookmark your local city, and then have that on your phone itself or your um, personal computer to come up. A lot of things on the, the website itself, a couple quick things, the seven day forecast, there's a text version, also icon based, high and low, what's the chance of rain, what's the wind speed, especially for the next couple days. You can also go farther down the page on the lower right is an hourly weather forecast. I really like to turn on and off things that I'm um, concerned about. So in this case, I'm displaying temperature, wind speed, and what's the chance of cloud. So 80%, 60% cloud cover. Um, I use this a lot in the summertime. When can I actually cut the grass? What's my chance of rain? Um, how warm is it going to be? How early do I need to get out in the morning before it really heats up? That's where the hourly weather graph is very useful. Back to our page. Again, weather.gov, no matter where you live, if you just click on the uh, part of the state you live in, you'll get the local office, same information. At the bottom, there's a bunch of icons. There's one called weather hazard briefing. Those are very useful, especially in our bigger events. Uh, this is an example of Hurricane Florence and then one of our biggest snowstorms. It's been a couple of years now, but still one of our bigger ones. Uh, we'll probably slide this slide out with the uh, ice storm we had this past winter, but January 18, uh, 2018, an example of one of the slides from that. So. They will not always be on the website, but they'll be there when we have active weather upcoming. We're very proud of our social media um, channels. We put a lot of good information on that. Our website is very good. There's a lot of information. I encourage you to look at it and bookmark it. Social media is where we wave our hands and say, hey, this is what you need to focus in on in terms of upcoming weather. So we're talking severe weather. This is an example from a couple of years ago where we had a heightened risk for severe weather and we did a um, Facebook Live on that. 
We're also on YouTube and Twitter, and I need to add Instagram to this. So no matter what your favorite uh, social media is, a lot of good information is put on that. And please help us out. There's a lot of information out there. Prior to a storm, we want you to share credible information. So it could be your favorite local broadcaster, or it could be us. Any reliable sources, you can help out your neighbors by sharing that uh, concise information from that site. A lot of folks are on mobile devices. Obviously, uh, we don't have an official weather service app, but what you can do is you can go to mobile.weather.gov and you can save it. Whether you have an Android or an iPhone, you can save it to your home screen. It will act very similar to an app. So again, that's mobile.weather.gov so that you can uh, do that. It also does work on uh, PCs as well. So we went over a couple definitions of what a severe thunderstorm was. We established that we've got a lot of offices in the country. We're open 24 seven. We're in your local community. To get a forecast, just go to weather.gov. Another good resource, especially if you're into severe weather, is the Storm Prediction Center. It's spc.noaa.gov. And those folks are the experts out in Oklahoma, much like the men and women down in Miami, uh, Florida at the Hurricane Center are the experts with tropical weather. And they issue outlooks on severe weather. And then they work with us at the local level to issue watches for tornadoes and severe thunderstorms. And they come out with the risk for the next eight days. Very, very good uh, information prior to severe weather to know um, what you may have in the area what you can anticipate from a safety standpoint, but also from a spotter perspective in terms of what you may uh, need to report and what days you might have to help us out. As far as thunderstorms go, we get a lot of them in uh, North Carolina, average days 40 to 50 per year. You can see the bullseyes down toward Florida, but really anywhere in the southeast part of the country averages a lot of uh, thunderstorms each uh, year. And the reason for that is much like we talked about recipes earlier with watches and warnings, you need certain ingredients in the environment for storms to happen. If you're missing one of them, they either just won't happen or they may not be as substantial as we uh, they would be if we had all those ingredients in abundance. So the first one we want is moisture. You need moisture for the clouds uh, to form. You need some type of lifting mechanism that's a trigger or push uh, to you know have the clouds rise and turn into um, you know, bigger thunderstorm tops. We'll talk about that in a second. And then something we are lacking a lot of in, in our part of the state, especially early in the season, is instability. Um, that is rising air in the atmosphere. And I like to think of it as fuel. If you have a lot of fuel around, you have a lot of potential for bad storms. Uh, but you need all three ingredients. Often in the summer, we have plenty of moisture. We can wear it. We have tons of humidity. We have plenty of instability. Um, a lot of fuel for storms in the summertime. Uh, but as far as severe weather, we might not have a real big lifting mechanism, something like a big cold front coming through. So we have to rely on smaller features like our sea breeze. So the first ingredient, this is the one that you never have to go to your neighbors for, almost always have it, very, very rare. Even if we're in drought conditions, it's just very rare to say we don't have enough moisture for thunderstorms in our area. Um, the exception would be, you know, days with high pressure and, you know, you wouldn't have lift, you wouldn't have instability either. So you'd be missing all of them. But as far as just moisture goes, uh, it's quite often we're very humid, especially late spring into the summer. We've got the ocean to our east. We've got the local sounds and uh, rivers. And then if our prevailing flow is not from the south, it is usually from the southwest and we have a moist flow out of the Gulf of Mexico. So as far as moisture goes, we usually have plenty of that. We don't have to worry about that. The one that we sometimes can lack, uh, especially early in the season, is instability. This is one thing we were watching this past weekend. Would we get warm enough? Would we get unstable enough to tap into that real strong cold front that was coming through, the real strong winds that were already here? Would the instability be around for us to have severe weather? And instability, you can think of it a couple of different ways, really the clash of air masses, cold versus warm air. Um, the greater the difference, um, the greater the instability. And there's a couple ways to think about it. On a summer, summer day, one way to think about it is it's really hot and humid down where we live at the ground. And as you go up into the atmosphere, if you've ever, ever been hiking in the mountains, as you get higher into the atmosphere, it usually cools. Well, if it cools really quick, that's a really unstable atmosphere because that air is naturally going to want to rise really quickly. So that's one example of instability. Another example is we're really warm 
here in Wilmington, but there's a sharp cold front between Raleigh and Asheville. Um, so we were really warm and humid on the eastern part of the state, really cool and dry the western part of the state. And there's a boundary, that cold front sweeping through, that can cause a difference in instability and that can cause some storms. So it's either really, really cold air pushing in or we have really cold air thousands of feet higher up in the atmosphere. What I want you to focus on is, uh, again, this is the science behind it. Uh, this is for your knowledge. You don't have to know this for, for calling in. We're gonna focus more on the calling in part here in a second. But with the Coke bottle example, the Coke is the moisture, so we've got plenty of it. If I were to shake that up, that would represent the instability. Nothing has happened at this point. You've got the moisture, you've got a lot of fuel, but we need that last ingredient, a trigger to kind of set things off. But notice the bubbly nature of the soda. That's what the atmosphere will look like. So this is a time lapse. Uh, we've got puffy cumulus clouds kind of billowing up and then collapsing. But notice here on the right, all of a sudden, once we get, you know, in this case, we probably reached a certain threshold that the cloud was allowed to span, expand up into the atmosphere, boom, shower in this case probably a thunderstorm eventually took off so this is just a time lapse of how clouds look um the bubbly nature that you see to them that's a, a, a really a sign of instability uh the more bubbly and tall and the more that they grow into the vertical it's a more unstable atmosphere and more conducive for severe weather this is what it would look like on a weather map um again a lifting mechanism is a, a cold front or a warm front in this case uh, you have really, really cold air moving in. It abruptly lifts the cloud up. This is where we tend to get our taller storms, um, more severe weather. Can you get severe weather along a warm front? Yes, uh, but along a cold front, that cold air just is really, really dense and it pushes in and it abruptly lifts the cloud. So it really causes them to grow in the vertical. Since they're so tall, they can tap into things like stronger winds. Since they're so tall, they have more time to be up in the part of the atmosphere that's below freezing and we, we can get things like hail. Uh, so that's what it would look like on a weather map with a cold front moving in. That's what we had this past weekend. Strong area of low pressure moved through, but it was the cold front that sweep through and caused uh, those storms across our region. The opposite of a cold front is a warm front. In this case, instead of cold air moving in, it's warm air moving in. The cold air is already there, it's dense. So the warm air rides up along it. It's very, very flat and shallow type of clouds. So we, you tend to get more showers. You can have thunderstorms, you can get tornadoes, you can certainly get severe weather, but on the whole, it's not as tall of a cloud, not as dynamic of a system. So we don't tend to get widespread severe weather events with warm fronts. Um, they have produced tornadoes here. They are something that we watch, especially with our proximity to the water, uh, but they are not you know, typically the big, big severe weather makers. So. As far as the science goes, we're going to sprinkle in a little bit more, but the whole point of the basic class is report, report, report. The first way we want to cover in terms of reporting is our most preferred way. That's our 800 number. We want to take a step back. Again, this is for Eastern North Carolina. If you're watching from Illinois, Virginia Beach, Maryland, um, procedures are probably the same. You know, call in high winds and hail, which we're going to talk about, but your, your number is going to be different. So please follow up with your local office to get uh, your local number. So back to the 800 number. The reason why we want you calling this is we can ask you questions. We go over this in the winter class, but it's especially important for the spring class. If you're calling in a tornado, if you're calling in large hail, we need to know about it as soon as you can do it, uh, report it to us safely. Reports after the fact are helpful, but as soon as you can do it safely, we wanna know about it. So if you email us, if you put it on Facebook, um, if you fill out one of our online forms, we will get it eventually. But if you pick up the phone, the 800 number, we've got multiple lines, we are ready to take your call. So please uh, put this into your phone. Um, I used to say write it down, but if you're like me, You've got plenty of papers at home and it, it will get lost in the shuffle. So please program this into your phone. When you come to our in-person classes, which we hope to do uh, in the middle to latter part of April, we have a magnet that you can put on your refrigerator to remember this. So please, please, please uh, stress using the 800 number above everything else. This is a special number. We don't want you calling asking for a forecast. We expect a specific procedure. You wanna say who you are. I'm a trained Skywarn spotter what you saw, 
where you saw it and when. And all four of these things are very, very important. If you saw it three minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, let us know that because we're gonna look at the radar and match it up with what's happening to confirm that it makes sense. So please uh, be specific with everything. You don't have to rush through this, but we've got a lot of people calling and it's a very dynamic time during severe weather. So who you are confirms that you've been through these classes, uh, you know what you're talking about, what you saw, where, um, location. I'm in downtown Greenville. I live six miles west of Cape Carteret. Th that's all really, really good information. So 800 number, 800 number, 800 number. A few other ways you can report. Email is, is good for follow-up. So maybe you call us and say, we've got quarter size hail. I wanna send you a picture. You can send it to our e email address. I should point out that I will do a course follow-up after this. So I know you have the certificate and you have a copy of the presentation, but in your email, I will send you links um, that I mentioned of Storm Prediction Center, the weather service here in Newport, but also the 800 number and email, all the spotter procedures. So uh, go ahead and program the number into your phone, but if you can't get it all down, don't worry, uh, we'll, we'll do a follow-up later tonight. Notice it's the same thing, who you are, what you saw, where you saw it, and when. Again, this class, our main goal is when you can do it safely, that you report severe weather to us. And email is a good follow-up for pictures and videos. So we talked about thunderstorms, moisture, instability, and lifts, some of the ingredients that we need uh, for them to hap happen. One more factor that we didn't mention is something called shear. Um, it's kind of a twist in the atmosphere. You can get it a couple different ways. As you go up in the atmosphere, if the winds change direction with height or if they change speed, let's say we've got light winds where we are at the surface and they're really strong a couple thousand feet up, that can induce a rotation or shear in the environment. If you have very, very weak shear and another term, a weak updraft, that's just rising air, you get a single cell storm, a pulse storm, garden variety storm, pop-up thunderstorm, a lot of different ways to say it. As you increase the shear and increase the um, strength of the winds going upwards, the updraft, you can get multiple cells, squall lines, and eventually supercells, which can produce some of the most severe weather across the area. So we're gonna go from left to right. Again, weak shear, weak updraft. This is your typical June, July, August, summertime thunderstorm. And notice the bubbly nature. We've got the instability. Uh, but it's very in the vertical. The cloud is straight up and down. And that's very, very important because it reduces the storm's chance of producing widespread severe weather. This is a cross section of a um, pulse or, or single cell uh, thunderstorm, very similar to like an MRI of your knee. This is like an MRI of the thunderstorm. And on the bottom is a timeline on how long it lasts. Uh, so notice between zero and 10 minutes, it goes from hardly anything to red, and this red is um, indicating strong winds, heavy rain, maybe some hail. And again, this is higher up in the storm itself. So boom, all of a sudden, nothing on radar to we've got a thunderstorm. But notice between 10 and 20 minutes, so just over the course of the next 10 minutes, whatever was happening higher up in that thunderstorm, wind, hail, strong winds, it is collapsing and it's reaching the ground by the 20 minute mark. So pulse storms, because they don't last very long in terms of um, their, their whole uh, lifespan, they don't have a long time to produce big, big hail. They don't have a long time to produce very, very strong winds. They are borderline severe often. Uh, so we'll get some small hail from them, gusty winds, uh, can't rule out a tornado, especially if it's uh, bumping into maybe another one or a sea breeze. Um, but because that they, they pulse up, and they collapse right on themselves, they don't last a very, very long time. Um, so again, when you're visualizing it, they pulse up, but since they're in the vertical, they just collapse on themselves and they can't suck in new fuel or instability to keep on going. And they just collapse and uh, a new one will pop up down the road. But one thing that's very common from them is to produce hail. This is where we get some of our hail in the summertime. And again, um, it tends to be just sub-severe, but sometimes it can be right around that one inch uh, threshold. The important thing is not um, how does this pulse storm form, it's if you get any size hail, we wanna know about it, any, any, any. You might say, well, Eric, you said that a severe thunderstorm is one inch in diameter, hail or larger. 
why don't you just want to know about that? The reason is we want to gauge how strong the storm is. The worst part of the storm may not have gone over your house, uh, but if you're getting penny sized hail and then down the street or 10 miles east of you, the storm looks way worse, then I can surmise that they're getting hail larger than the size of pennies. So that's why it's important to let us know anytime you get hail, please give us a call. And you wanna either measure it or give it um, an estimate based on size. I know if you're like me, I've got the card, occasionally cash. Uh, I don't have a lot of coins, but still that's probably the best way to measure um, small to medium hail, size of a pea, a penny, a quarter. Once you start to get larger, uh, larger objects like golf balls, we have had that in the area before, um, you can use those types of uh, descriptors. You can also measure the hail. Again, safety first. The storm happens, it's hailing, um, it leaves, you don't hear thunder anymore, go outside and measure it. Um, so again, safety first, measuring would be the best. And this is an example on the bottom. It may look kind of you know irregular, especially if you get a big, big hailstone. Hail is pretty neat, not for your car or your siding, but scientifically it's pretty neat because it's, it's a water drop, falls out of the cloud and gets sucked back up into the updraft. And then because of gravity, or it freezes, and because of gravity, it falls back down, back into the updraft, falls back down. So it makes many, many cycles. Um, if we have a 30, 40 mile per hour updraft, you're only talking pea size hail. But if the updraft 60, 70, 80 miles per hour, that hailstone may uh, last 20 minutes in the thunderstorm. And that's where you get your quarter or golf ball, ball size hail. So if you were to actually cut a hailstone in half, especially a big one, it looks like tree rings. Those are the layers of accretion each time it goes up and down in the cloud. But uh, one thing, please never, ever, ever, ever use marbles to report the size of hail. They vary in shape, uh, so definitely don't want to do that. Uh, here's an example of using quarters, nickels, or pennies. If you do uh, report marble size hail, tell them uh, Charlie taught you at the weather service or somebody else. Um, please don't say Eric taught you uh, to report marbles because we don't want that. And here's an example of how to you know, send a picture. Um, if you if you take that quarter away, it looks like almost golf ball size hail, but with the quarter in the picture, uh, it's a really good reference for what's happening in terms of hail side. So I'm not sure how these videos are going to come across. This is kind of a test. We like to show a lot of videos to the in-person classes. Um, so I'm going to give this a test in the presentation. If it doesn't play really well on your end, I did upload it as a video to the um, the panel. So where you can download the uh, PDF of the uh, presentation, your certificate, all these videos are there as well. So let's give this a, a whirl here. So this is just last uh, June. This is west of Pollocksville. A lot of hail. And notice as the video plays, um, you can see some of the leaves uh, falling down. Those are leaves being stripped by the hail. A um, lot, a lot of hail. With this particular storm, we also had some strong winds as well. But we can certainly get hail around here. We've had, um, you know, usually each summer we get a couple reports of very large hail. The impressive thing about this storm was the amount. So you can see the grass is, um, or the ground is white. It almost looks like snow. And again, look really carefully at the video. As the leaves are falling through the sky, that's because they're being stripped with that hail. If you had trouble viewing this, if this is too slow, let me know in the chat. I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of interested how it played for everybody. So let me know uh, how it played on your end. And if you, um, again, had an issue, the video itself can be downloaded um, for, from the course itself. So hail summary, any size hail. It doesn't have to be just giant hail. Any size hail, we want to know about it. Measure the largest stone. In that example I showed you from Maysville, uh, west of Maysville, they had a lot of hail, but whatever the largest one is, that's the one we want to know about. Uh, so an example might be, hey, we're getting tons of nickel size hail, but a few are as large as the size of a quarter and never, ever, ever um, use it as a uh, marble because the marbles vary in size, blue, yellow, red, you know, which one is it? Uh, Chuck, thank you for the uh, uh, feedback and Jessica, thank you very much. Uh, perfect. Heather Heather said this as well. So yeah, everything is, has been moving around with the uh, presentations. That's something new we're doing this year. Um, we usually save the videos for in-person, but um, yeah, I'm glad that worked for everyone. Very, very good. So back to that first graphic, a little bit of updraft, weak shear, pulse storm. You know, can you get wind and hail? Yes, but it's, it's kind of on the border usually of severe. If you increase the shear, 
notice in this example, the clouds, instead of just in the vertical, they're tilted a little bit. And the significance of that is it makes severe weather a little more likely because instead of pulsing up and collapsing on itself, it's tilted, so it's constantly sucking in new, warm, moist air. And remember, we need moisture and we need instability. We need the thing to continue. We've already got the lift because the storm is, is chugging along, uh, but we need uh, new fuel for the storm. So if we have increased shear, we can get things like multiple storms or lines of storms. And when this happens, especially if they move over the same area over and over again, we can get flash flooding. Now in our area, uh, this picture is from the western part of the state. We don't have the terrain quite as much, well, not quite as much at all compared to the western part of the state. Um, you know, if it's it's if you travel, you know, toward Raleigh, it seems like you're going up a going up a hill compared to the eastern part of the state. So we don't have the terrain, uh, but in urban areas um, and areas that we get repeated rainfall, we have had in instances of almost like flash ponding because it is not moving very quickly, but it can be quite deep. Uh, so we can certainly get that. Um, it's not uncommon for us to get three, four, five inches of rain in a very short period of time. This happened in Cape Carteret two years ago. Tremendous amount of rain. Um, we get thunderstorms that produce rain here. That's not uncommon. But when they move over the area over and over again, that's when we can get into some trouble. So what we want to know about flooding is something significant. We're not talking about ponding at the end of your road that always happens because it's a low spot. We're talking about something that is unique. You've lived here 10 years and it only happens every three or four years or you've never seen it before. Something significant. Ideally, we wanna know about it before it gets bad. Um, so if the road is covered, you know, if it's getting toward that point, you know, let us know so that we can update our warning or update the information if need be. And I don't want you out there with a ruler like you are with you know, measuring the hailstones, but use something to tell us how deep the water is. Uh, it's up to the hubcaps of a car, it's up to a stop sign. You're the eyes and ears in the community. Are roads passable, that type of thing. So this is an example of what we would more commonly see. Again, very, very flat in our area, especially toward the coast, uh, but this is significant. This is not something people should be driving through. If you have a rain gauge, that would be even better. So perhaps you have a, a weather station, which is fine. Uh, this is a tipping bucket rain gauge. Um, that's a, a perfectly acceptable uh, measurement. I would really encourage you to think about Coco Raws and get a rain gauge like this. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but having a precise measurement is really helpful. Um, so chances are you're not going to have flooding in your immediate area. But if you have one of these, you can tell us we got three inches of rain or four and a half inches of rain. And our rough rule is about two inches, two inches in a day, two inches in a short period of time. There's no strict, um, you know, if you call up with an inch and a half, we're not going to say, hey, we don't want your report. We just don't want you thinking that you have to call in with every drop that falls. So something significant, two inches in a short period of time or two inches in a, um, you know, over the span of a day, just give us a buzz. I mentioned Coco Raws, again, in your follow-up email, link to our website, um, copy uh, of your certificate, um, links to SPC. We're going to have a link to Coco Raws. So write it down if you want. It's cocoraws.org. Great website. You can get training. You can find out how to purchase one of these rain gauges, how to set it up in your yard. This is for folks that are very interested in weather and want to do it a little more consistently. So Skywarn is volunteer. Please report when you get bad weather. Chances are you're not going to call us a lot because you won't get bad weather all the time. Coco Raws is, I'm interested in weather, I can't get enough of it. I wanna make a commitment to report precipitation every day. Most of the time it's gonna be nothing, a couple times a week or a couple times a month, depending on how much rain or snow you get, uh, you will log into the website or you can do the app on the phone and report precipitation. Really, really good program, really helps us out with precipitation measurement across our area, and not just our area, that goes for anybody uh, across the, the country. So. We mentioned a little more shear, stronger updraft. We start ramping things up. We can get a lot of storms. They can organize into a lot of heavy rain, or they can organize into something called a squall line that uh, ramps up the potential for strong winds. This is exactly what we saw this past Saturday. If you ever see a you know real sharp, sharp line of red and yellow on the radar and not a lot out ahead of it, we call that a sharp reflectivity gradient. That is a sign of strong winds. In addition, if it bows out like this, that's a sign of strong winds. 
Nothing just happens in the atmosphere because that is uh, the winds pushing that line out ahead um, and that, that will uh, usually lead to some strong winds. Sometimes when you get that, you get something called a shelf cloud. Uh, this doesn't always mean severe weather, but this is just a fantastic photo uh, back in 2017. Uh, what you're seeing is the outflow, the rain cooled air, the uh, downdraft of the thunderstorm itself. At the very least, the winds are going to pick up and the wind's going to shift direction. Uh, but sometimes it, it does mean severe weather as well. These striations in the clouds, that's a sign of the, the whole thing is rotating. A true severe thunderstorm does rotate, um, not just, just uh, torna tornadic ones. So one thing I want you to get out of this video, this is also in your, um, your download. Um, you can um, see the you know, impact of severe weather in our area. This is a microburst. The whole point of this is to emphasize that tornadoes get a lot of attention and there's cer certainly something to be respected, um, but microbursts are, straight, you know, we call them straight line winds. They can be as strong as tornadoes. So let me go back to this. If I can get it to play. One second, there we go. Okay, so this is the same storm that produced that hail west of Pollocksville. A little farther to the south and west, they had a microburst in a thunderstorm. And you'll see in this video, the winds picking up the rain and then whoosh. It may only last 30 seconds to a minute. This is a little over a minute video. This is security a camera from one of the houses we did the storm uh, damage uh, survey on. In a thunderstorm, winds go up, very, very strong updraft, but winds also come down. And in a microburst, again, that's just a downdraft. That's a normal process of a thunderstorm. This is a severe thunderstorm. You can see how strong the winds were. I think we estimated over 70 or 80 with this, if I'm not mistaken. So they can produce damage. And we just want to emphasize that this is a, you know, a severe thunderstorm and why we put out those warnings. So we mentioned reporting flash flooding. We mentioned reporting hail. Another thing we can get is certainly wind damage. So what's damaged? If you have an anemometer and you can tell us what the wind speed was, great. But we really want to know about what is damaged or not damaged uh, because that will tell us how strong the winds were. Are trees down, branches down, any shingles off? Uh, those types of things are very, very useful uh, for us estimating wind. By far the most, um, the way we really want your reporting is the 800 number. I mentioned email, Facebook or social media is another way you can send us pictures and video, but please, 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 please make sure you call us first, especially if it's something time sensitive. And what I mean by that again is tornadoes, hail, they're very, very isolated and we need to know about them as soon as you can do so safely. If you do uh, social media and you report it that way, again, good for pictures and video, please identify yourself. You've sat through this class, for some of you, this is multiple classes, Give yourself credit, tell us where you're from, what you saw and the time you saw it. So procedure is the same. So we're almost wrapping things up here as we get toward, toward the end of the class. Um, we're at the far end of the spectrum, supercells. We've got the most shear and the most rotation or most shear and the strongest updraft. So that is a full blown uh, supercell. Um, this is what it will look like in a textbook, very, very strong updraft on the left side uh, of the storm itself. Uh, and then the front side of the storm is the dark and the worst looking part. That's where our downdraft is, our heavy wind, um, heavy rain, and also potential for hail. This is a classic supercell as it would look in a textbook. Uh, this is how it would look on a radar. Uh, this is um, actually in 2018, a lot of folks remember the, the snow we had in January, of course, Florence in September, but we did have an EF1 tornado in uh, Atlantic Beach. Uh, this is what it look, would look like. A lot of times people talk about a hook echo. Um, this is the reflectivity mode of the radar, and you can see the precipitation wrapping back around the circulation, which would be here. And this is how it looks like in a textbook. So kind of a classic hook echo on radar of a tornado. Uh, we don't always get those. It doesn't always look textbook like that, but just an interesting um, thing to show you. And one unique thing about this, and um, not just our area, but especially in the wintertime months or the cool season, I know we had a gentleman um, from uh, the Kansas City office that's taken the class with us. Our supercells tend to be much smaller. So instead of real tall and big in height in terms of depth, um, when we get them, they can be much smaller in structure. So it can be quite hard to distinguish uh, across our area. One way we get tornadoes uh, is not just summertime with thunderstorms, but we certainly can get them from tornadoes or from tornadoes. We can get them from tropical cyclones. It doesn't just have to be hurricanes, it could be tropical storms. 
And majority are weaker, which is good, but they happen really, really quick. And they can you know, cause an, an enhanced areas of damage outside of the um, hurricane or tropical storm force winds as well. Another tornado we get, this is very, very common, are water spouts. A tornado on water is a water spout. These are some pictures as we cycle through. Um, a traditional one from a thunderstorm um, occurs and they tend to be very, very narrow, uh, very, very weak. Um, but if you're uh, on the boat or at the beach, you know, no matter how weak they are, they're, they're a big deal because you're so much more vulnerable. But I'm pointing that out because while wind speeds can reach 100 miles per hour, often they're very, very small. And again, to that gentleman on the beach or you on the boat, they look huge. But in the whole scheme of things, they're not from a big supercell. They're not from a tall um, storm cloud. So they're hard to see on radar. So your reports of those are very, very important to us. Um, you know, to, to get those warnings out and, um, and just confirm what we may be seeing on radar. So we went over flooding and hail and wind. Tornado is one of the last ones we'll go over. The big thing with this is it's got to have rotation. So again, uh, safety first. If you're seeing it approach your house, you know, you, you certainly want to uh, seek shelter in the lowest part of your home away from windows. Um, as you call in a report to us, we're going to ask questions. Does it have rotation? Uh, does it extend to the ground? What's the damage like if it's already moved through? Be real clear about what's happening and be really clear. Uh, is it a water spout or a tornado, which would be over land? And we're going to show you some pictures here coming up to reiterate what I mean about rotation and extending to the ground. Twitter is another way to make a report. Do not want you to send us a tweet that there's a tornado on the ground. That's again, call us, call us, call us. But Twitter is a good way for um, after, you know, pictures, videos, much like email, much like, uh, like Facebook, um, same type of procedure, uh, what you saw, where you saw, and when, and then I keep forgetting to adjust this. Um, I need to add that, uh, you know, that you're a trained spotter, because with the uh, character increase a couple years ago now, you can certainly do that. So we've got a couple quiz questions for you, and I'll, I'll launch these as a poll here in a second. So um, I'll give you one more chance to remember funnel clouds and tornadoes have got to be rotating and the difference between a tornado and a funnel cloud is is it in contact with the ground or not so my question is are these funnel clouds um, so they're low hanging certainly kind of gnarly looking dark triangular uh, this one wow it's it's it, it looks it looks very impressive uh, and the hint is they are not rotating so let me ask you we'll do it as a poll question is this um, a funnel cloud? Let's see, or is this a funnel cloud? We'll say, is it a funnel cloud? Let's launch this. So yes or no on the funnel cloud. And again, it is not rotating. Give it about another five seconds. Very good. I think we hammered that home. So everybody got that one. And again, you might say, well, you know, Eric, that that's pretty obvious. You said it's not rotating, it's not rotating. I'm glad you all got it right. You've been through the class. And again, if you told somebody in the general public that had not been through a class, this picture on the right or this, I mean, that looks like, you know, funnel cloud that's almost making it to the ground as a tornado. Uh, we get these a lot. Uh, these are called scud clouds, scattered cumulus under deck, low hanging clouds. Um, they look threatening, but again, I'd say just about every year we get reports of uh, funnel clouds or tornadoes from uh, clouds that look real ominous, but they have got to be rotating. And again, you will notice the rotation. It's not something that's not talking swirling or clouds, you know, moving around. And we're talking tight rotation. You will know if it's a tornado or funnel cloud. Uh, speaking of tornadoes, we rate them on the EF scale. The lower the number, um, the less lesser damage, the higher the number, more damage. One thing I like to put in here just kind of as a science thing and how we determine if it's a tornado or not. We go on something that's called a storm survey um, to determine a couple things. Number one, what's the pattern of the damage? And number two, what's the amount of damage? It's the pattern of the damage that actually determines if it's a tornado or not. So this is Mr. Chad, he's a summer intern uh, many, many years ago. And we look for the pattern if trees are uh, pointing toward each other and we really like uprooted trees not for the homeowner, that obviously is not a good thing, but uprooted trees fall in the direction that the wind blows. So we don't look at branches and small objects, we look at uprooted trees 
And if they're pointed toward each other or something called convergent, uh, that's often a sign, especially if it's a narrow path and it's kind of chaotic and um, chopped up, uh, that would be more conducive of a tornado. A microburst, um, it's not so much that they're all going in the same direction, but it's same direction or, or in a fan shape. So it would be as if I took this uh, can of Sprite, we'll call it water, and you dumped it on the table, uh, that would simulate a microburst or downdraft. The strong winds have descended out of the thunderstorm and they just hit the ground and they spread out. So the trees are just kind of flattened. Um, they may be you know, in differing directions, but if they are, they're fanned out. Um, that would be a sign of a microburst. And every survey we go on, we try to reiterate this because a lot of times if people have a lot of damage to their yard, um, they assume it's a tornado and they may even say, hey, I, I heard the train sour, siren that uh, folks hear, you know, they hear a rumbling. What you're hearing is strong wind. Um, could be tornado or it could be, you know, regular wind from a thunderstorm. But we don't want to belittle it because microbursts can produce winds 80 to 100 miles per hour. So, again, pattern, pattern, pattern uh, for what it is. And then the damage is determined by what's damaged. Is it a pine tree, softwood tree, mobile home, brick home? Uh, what has it been really wet out? We have a big binder and it'll give us a range of um, lower bound wind, est or average and an upper bound. And that's where factors come into, oh, well, it's been really wet, so let's go on the lower end of an uprooted tree, about 70 miles per hour. So a uh, very interesting, it's very heartbreaking to see the damage in the community and to talk to folks. Um, but we like to try to explain how we come up with um, microburst or tornado because um, sometimes people think that it's a lesser thing, but that's not really the case. And it's about the pattern. So another spotter quiz. Um, let's see here. Oh, and I, I see some of the comments in here. We've got really, really good. Um, uh, let's see. Jessica mentioned even before I showed it on the screen. Jessica, this is awesome. She asked, uh, would that be call, called a scud cloud? This is a couple slides ago. So very, very good job. You saw that it was. And we've got uh, Mr. Ty. He's one of our regional coordinators for uh, Coco Raws. We appreciate your service uh, in the Coco Raws program. It's a really, really good one. So thanks, Ty, for your comment. All right, so here's another question, tornado or funnel cloud? The hint with this is it is not, oh, <laughs> it is rotating, so it is rotating, no, no tricks with this, uh, but put your glasses on the, for this one, I'll give you that. So I'll give you one more, five more seconds to stare at the picture, is it tornado or funnel cloud? It is rotating, so if you put on your glasses, that's your hint for that. Which one do you think it is? This is a little bit of a trick. I hope you looked at that image really closely. So funnel cloud or tornado, I'll give you another 10 seconds. Very good. So most of you got it. So this one is a tornado. Tornado. So for those that didn't get it, that's all right. It was uh, designed a little bit of a trick or an emphasis on why. And the why is, so you all saw this, your eyes are drawn toward this, and I said it was rotating. So you know it's either tornado or funnel cloud. So now the distinction is, is it in contact with the ground? And your eye is drawn toward this, but you don't see anything here. But the circulation does extend to the ground because of this debris or dust or dirt, or whatever's being sucked up. So a um, little bit tricky of a question. The reason why we do that is to confirm it's gotta be in contact with the ground. Uh, you can call us and just be clear, hey, I see at least a funnel cloud. It looks, you know, I can't see it past the tree line. That's that's a perfectly reasonable uh, report, but just trying to uh, emphasize it's gotta be in contact with the ground to be a tornado. So as we wrap things up here, um, another way to report information to us is something really cool called MPing. You can get this on whatever phone you have, um, uh, I, you know, um, Android or Apple. Um, they're anonymous reports. We just got one out of Jacksonville from this last event. I know some of you have radar apps that allow you to report via MPing as well. It started traditionally as a precipitation program with a NASA uh, Weather Service and Oklahoma University. So this is an image showing the precipitation report, snow and rain and ice. Uh, but you can report damage that way as well. Um, it's a unique way to report. I still would prefer the 800 number because you only are given uh, a couple options. So it can make it sound really dramatic. Uh, for some of the options when it might not be as bad. So we can ask you about that if you call us on the phone. So again, please, please, please call. 
a couple things to wrap up and then we're going to turn it over to you for questions um our job is to issue warnings before it happens and to not issue warnings for non-severe events the more times you call the more clear picture we have we're not saying you know call for every raindrop but we are saying call for every hailstone we are saying call for when you have you know, wind damage, gusty winds, 50, 60 miles per hour, or, or branches to report down. We are saying call with rainfall amounts, uh, tornadoes, flooding. We want to hear from you. Don't assume that your neighbor down the road called because they're probably not a spotter. Don't assume that we have that information. Sometimes we're the last to know. And we really want these reports real time. Safety first, but the sooner we know, the sooner we can update the information or add it to our warning. With that said, if you get back from vacation, you've got some trees down, you know a really bad storm came through, it's still useful to us. Call us and just be real clear about that. Uh, if it's a sunny day and you say, hey, I live in Pine Town and we had 10 trees down, we're not, it's not gonna make sense to us because it's a nice day. So uh, I went to Myrtle Beach, I just got back and I've been gone the whole last week, but something bad happened and this is what I wanna report. So again, 800 number is definitely the most preferred way. We mentioned this already, we're already aware of what's going on, not the case. This is an example of a tornado in Greene County up near Snow Hill. This is back in 2014. So don't assume that we know, please, please, please call and make those reports. A review of when you should contact us. We mentioned tornadoes and funnel clouds, please confirm the rotation. Any size hail, not just severe hail. Wind damage, if you have an anemometer, great. You don't have to have one, use your eyes. What's damaged? Uh, was that tree already diseased? Was it weakened? Is it a big oak that's been there forever? That's useful information for us to know. Flooding um, is very helpful to let us know about that. And then again, consider Cocoa Raws when you're talking about joining um, you know, precipitation program. So to summarize, we mentioned the 800 number. These are some of the other ways you can report. But again, I really wanna emphasize the 800 number. If you did not get a chance to put this in your phone, that's okay. We're gonna do a follow-up email with all that information in it. When should you not call us? Non-severe weather. So remember, if you call and say, it's really, really windy out, or we've had some really, really heavy rain, we appreciate the effort, but it's not anything concrete that we can work on. The same thing is if you call and say, I'm estimating 70 mile per hour winds, what is leading you to that? Do you have some trees down? Do you have an anemometer that measured it? So again, be specific. If you don't have a specific report, uh, please do not call that in. And then uh, we don't need to know about lightning. Sometimes we'll get calls that, hey, there's a lot of lightning. Uh, we generally can see that, so we don't need to know about that. So a few of you had mentioned that you've been to the winter class and you've been to other classes. We really appreciate that. We're gonna transition now the last part of the talk to talk about a year round spotter. It is unlikely, thankfully, that you will see a tornado. You probably will see some hail at some point if you haven't already. You'll definitely see some rain and gusty winds. Maybe not enough to call it in in terms of damage. But bottom line is it's rare to have true severe weather to call into us. Luckily, it's very isolated. It's very likely, even us living in eastern North Carolina, to have a little snow or certainly rain to report to us. So we've really changed our Skywarn program. The old school thought was just spring weather, tornadoes, hail, and we want you to be a year round spotter. Consider joining Cocoa Raws. Consider thinking about reporting snowfall. If you do snowfall, take a couple measurements, get, you get your average to the nearest tenth and give us a call with that report. We certainly go way, way, way more in depth uh, in our winter Skywarn. So as we wrap things up, consider some of these other classes. You just took the basic spring class. That's the traditional class. Um, everybody in the weather service pretty much does. Look for the basic winter one, late November through February. We do do occasionally a flood or tropical sky warn that goes over a rainfall measurement. Also some historic tropical and flood systems in our area. And then in advanced class, we usually do that in May. Um, there's a loose requirement that we want you to go through the basic first. And the whole idea uh, behind that is the advanced class is a lot more science and we want you to have the foundation, not for knowledge, but for reporting. We really, really want you to know how to report because that's what we want you to do more than just being the scientist on weather. We always put this information on our website, weather.gov newport. It's at the top news of the day. 
or there's a Skywarn icon at the bottom. Again, our goal is that you report year round. Uh, this is our website. We will send that out. If you missed any of this training, you, you're just stepping back. We will post the recording. If you need to see it tonight, uh, we have a tab called YouTube training and we kind of broke it into seven parts. Uh, if you didn't like it from me, I apologize because you'll, you'll get more of me on this, uh, this YouTube channel here if you go to it. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you. We, we hit the hour mark one minute past. Uh, so we 